little introductory remark, remarks. Um, thank you everyone for finding your way to our new location here at Arity. It's an absolutely beautiful space. We really appreciate Arity uh, for, for hosting us and providing a, a wonderful meal for everybody. Um, and so yeah, we are going to continue being at Arity for the next six months. We're really looking forward to that. Uh, I just wanted to flag real quick for next month. Our tentative speak, uh, speaker will be talking about an uh, introduction to Plotly Dash, which is a, <coughs> a framework for creating analytic web applications in Python, so you don't have to use any JavaScript. Um, but going back to Arity, uh, I just wanted to introduce Jared. He's our host from Arity, and he's going to talk a little bit about this wonderful space. And anybody who's interested, I think he's going to offer a tour later afterwards. So this is Jared. Everybody, uh, I'm Jared, as you can see. Um, so I guess I could like to start with like, what is Arity? So like, Arity is a company set out by Allspace um, to focus on driving data and using that to better support insurance and monetize it. So um, I, I'm actually in all state, I'm like a dog blind to Arity, so I, most of my work focuses on like things that Arity does. Um, so, good news for prospective data scientists is like both all state and Arity are hiring data scientists right now, and also, uh, and also other data focused roles like uh, data analytics engineers who are both like pulling data from different databases and managing data managing um, business analytic consultants who are people who are more focused on like the communication aspect of data, so it's like working with the data scientists to communicate results to business partners. Uh, so we're hiring for all of those. Um, I guess a brief like we're and also there's a lot of area and all state folks here, mostly for some reason congregate in that corner back there. Um, so like I'm sure maybe you know, AOI and Sean. Um, so <laughs> I'm not sure they'd be happy to answer any questions and I would as well off the presentation. Uh, so just like before you start, it's like a quick word on like why Allstate slash Arity is a good place to work. So like I I have been in the workforce for too long, but before this job I was like I was at like a really small startup. <clears throat> and there's like a lot of romance around that, right? Because like you do something and like immediately that's the bottom line. So, like I found there's a lot to love like these big Fortune 50 companies because there's a lot of there's a lot of work that you don't want to do that you don't have to do. So like if you want to use Spark, it's not your responsibility to like spin out the AWS cluster and install Spark and make sure all the dependencies work nicely together and like then get up and running. Like we have really talented folks in IT uh, and who manage our clusters and make sure they're running all the time. So you really focus on like the bread and butter of what you do, the data science aspect. Um, I think another thing working at all states, like there's a lot of uh, creative freedom. So like I don't I have a lot of control of the tool I use, the methods I use, so long as I can the problems that's up for me. Um, and finally, like this nice new space, it's convenient where I live, and it's generally a nice place to work. And uh, Rachel and Taylor in the back there will be giving a tour after the presentation's over, so if that's something you'd be interested in, congregate in the back corner there. Is that good? Great. Um, so with that, yeah, it's all safe and <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right. So yeah. So next month, uh, hopefully, we can uh, finalize this probably dash. Um, and then uh, March, April. We have April lined up. May. We need a speaker for May and June. If anybody is interested in speaking and getting out in front of people and getting your name out there and get some cool, uh, some cool data science or data analytics or anything related to data and Python and presenting and helping us build this community. That'd be much appreciated. Just come see me or G, the other co-organizer, after the show. And without further ado, very happy to introduce David Luther. So David Luther, uh, he's gonna be presenting on SACS, no SACS, instrument detection with PyTorch. And I think there's two things you kind of catch in the title. It has something to do with music and has something to do with data science. And in fact, that's kind of the uh, background of David Luther. He actually spent nine years soloing for Meatloaf as a saxophonist. And I guess somehow that interest in saxophone became an interest in data science, a very natural transition. We've all been there, we've all gone through that. Um, and as he was deciting to uh, investigate his curiosity into data science, 
he decided to join a, a boot camp, uh, Metis, which is a local Chicago boot camp that helps train the next generation of great data scientists. And I reached out to, to, to Metis to, to get their responses into his instructor over at Metis, and uh, he couldn't have been more glowing. He called David the quintessential data science graduate and just said, just commented on how driven, curious, coachable, and smart he is. Um, he's very, they're very excited that he's going to be sharing his uh, key presentation, his key thesis presentation from his uh, Metis experience. Um, and with that, you know, one thing to note, as a recent graduate of Metis, David will be looking for a position, so maybe David, you should hook up with Jared later and exchange some information. But if anybody's interested in hiring a smart and talented data scientist, um, reach out to him after the show. All right, so David. sample got labeled with its own particular chunk ID, and then I stored a record of each sample in a MongoDB data database hosted on an AWS instance. Next, how do you label 24,000 different samples? I sure wasn't going to do it all by myself. <clears throat> so, 
enter Flask and JavaScript. Uh, I put together a website that would allow anywhere, anyone anywhere to listen and label. So people can listen to an MP3 that's queued up randomly, uh, then choose, choose what they hear. Are, is there saxophone in there? Is there vocals? Uh, is it in the foreground or the background? Uh, users also have the option to skip a sample if they can't really decide what it is. So this is kind of how I try to correct for errors and make it as accurate as possible. Now, as of now, there are still a whole lot of samples left to be labeled. I put 24,000 up there, and we're at about 2,500 right now. So if any of you are particularly musical, and you want to procrastinate, or uh, you just uh, feel like giving to the common good, the site is still live at audiosamplelabeler.com. So once you have labeled samples, how do you get a neural net to recognize audio? Now, one way of doing this is to turn it into a problem of image recognition instead. And you do this by turning the song into a spectrogram. And here's one right here. I think they're kind of lovely and want to uh, wallpaper my living room with them. Um, so on the y-axis, you have your frequency. So uh, the higher you go, the higher the pitch. And then on the x, you have your time. And so the harmonic bands here uh, represent the harmonic, or the, the, excuse me, the horizontal bands here uh, in orange represent the harmonic activity of the instrument. And you can see where it's diagonal, that's where the pitch would be bending, and these are going to be the kind of patterns that we'll try to detect. And this spectrogram is of that intro clip that I played, and I'll play it again so you can follow along. <laughs> Pretty clear. So there are three different uh, parameters that you have to take into account when you're making a spectrogram. And what you're doing is performing a fast Fourier transform on that clip of digital audio. Now the first factor would be your Mel bands. And these are the number of frequency bins, uh, you know, how many divisions along that y-axis. And this essentially turns into your y-axis resolution. Um, the next is your hop length, and this is how many individual samples go between each FFT calculation. And this will be inversely related to your x-axis resolution. You just think the, 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 the more samples you take in a finite amount of time, the smaller the hop length, etc. So then you have the FFT length, which is how many individual samples uh, go into each FFT calculation. And this is usually about four times the hot length. And that, that's generally enough to capture all the different uh, frequencies in the audible spectrum from 20 hertz all the way up to 20,000. So now we can get to uh, the convolutional neural nets. And I'll give a very, very high level view over the training process. So at the time of training, I generate the spectrogram from the data set and then pass it to the convolutional layers. And this alternates between convolutional layer and max pooling, where we're pulling out patterns from the image in, or the spectrogram, and then reducing the information through max pooling. Next, I pass the strength of these patterns, strengths of these patterns to the fully connected layers. These reduce all these inputs to uh, two possible outputs, um, sax or no sax. Uh, we send this through softmax, which standardizes the two measurements so you get the probabilities of each category. Now this whole process is known as feed forward. Um, from those predicted probabilities and the actual values, which are 0 and 1, uh, we calculate the loss and then through back propagation, we update all the weights and, uh, or excuse me, calculate the gradients and update the weights. So now we can move on to PyTorch. But first, to understand anything about the actual building of the model, we have to, we have to fully understand two objects, the data set and the data loader object. And once, once you crack these, the rest is fairly straightforward, as straightforward as PyTorch can be. So the data loader is a built-in class, um, and this is creating an object that you use to feed data into the model. Uh, this is where you would specify your batch size and the number or, or whether or not you shuffle between epics, etc. Uh, you're going to iterate through this object during the fit and predict processes and it'll dispatch the data in batches. Next is the actual data set class uh, 
and this is something that you will write yourself, and it's basically a customized form uh, of a parent class that PyTorch provides. Uh, and that just passes data from your whole data set to the data loader. And this will make a little bit more sense, I think, uh, if I put it in terms of pictures. So here's uh, a representation of the workflow with my project. So I'm pulling a data set out of the database that I've created in Mongo and passing this to the data set class. Now when I say a data set, I am not using every single labeled sample here. Uh, what I do, um, and this, this worked well as the set kept on growing, uh, because I could say, okay, now how many, how many samples do I have where saxophone is in the foreground? And so I pull all those samples into the data set and then also pull an equal number of samples out that don't have any saxophone in them whatsoever. And this creates a nice balanced data set for me to do training test on. So now, once you have that object, you can pull the actual data, which in my case would be the audio, into the data set class and then pass that to the data loader. Next, you use the data loader on those, those spectrograms in batches to your uh, to your model for either fit or predict. Now the best thing about this is that you can create spectrograms on the fly and this was my huge aha moment here. I, I, up to this point I thought I would need to have a folder full of spectrograms for every single sample and at about, uh, depending on your resolution, I mean these can be about 1.5 meg to 2 meg and once you have 20,000 of these, this is a lot of gigabytes full of spectrograms. So the fact that I can just create one from the digital audio file is, you know, and, and pass it to the model and don't have to store it was a huge game changer. So next, let's walk through the setup of a data set class. So first you have to do an import torch.utils.data, that's data utility. We create the instance of the class, uh, I call mine Spectra Dataset, and this, um, this, this uses the dataset class as its parent. And you have to define these three met methods here, the init, the length, and get item. And the last one is kind of where all the fun happens. This is where you tell it what to do when you query the class uh, for an index number. So the init method, uh, there's several parameters here. You have the data group data frame, which is just a very simple two column pandas data frame of that data set I described earlier. It includes the unique ID of each sample and its ground truth, which would be zero for no sax and one for saxophone. Next, there's the scaling factor, and this is where I choose how large or small the spectrograms are going to be. Uh, next is just a path to where the audio lives. Finally, transforms. Uh, this is where you indicate any sort of transformations that you're going to make on your data. Uh, typically, image transforms. PyTorch has a whole library, uh, and you can insert one here or stack them one on top of another. Uh, this is really handy if you have a bunch of like, thousands and thousands of images that are all different sizes. You need to have them all at the same dimensions in order to pass them to the model and not break the model. So here's where you would put something like a resize. You could also put a random crop or a random rotation just to get the most out of the data set. Here I just map them to the class uh, variables. The only thing here that we should notice is the audio params. Now these are the three that we talked about earlier, the hop length, um, the FFT length, and the number of bell bands. And this is what we pass to the spectrogram generator. Uh, this is also what we multiply or divide uh, by the scaling factor in order to, to determine the size. So the length method, very easy. We just return the uh, first number in the pandas data frame shape attribute, which tells us exactly how many samples we have in this data, data set. And now the get item. Uh, so you can see it takes the index and returns the corresponding uh, record. So first, just uh, ask the data frame which chunk ID lives at an <coughs> index number. Draw that out. Pass that to our audio loader, and then that spits out the that loads up the audio and also spits out a sample rate. We put these into the spectrogram generator, 
which returns a 2D NumPy array. And you can see here's where the scaling comes into play. Uh, and this is where it would, um, this is where we make it larger or smaller based on that. These next three are just to format it in a way that PyTorch wants it to be. Uh, first, we add a singleton dimension to the 2D array. Uh, and this is our channel dimension. Uh, think about an RGB image. You're going to have one stack of red pixels, uh, one, one array of green and one of blue. And then so you'd have three different dimensions in your channel dimension. Even though we just have one here, PyTorch will expect it, so we put it on there. Next, I normalize everything on a scale of negative one to one. And finally, just turn the NumPy array into a torch float tensor. Now, if we had any transforms here, this is where we would apply them. It's incredibly straightforward. Uh, then, we return a tuple that is the spectrogram as a torch tensor. And then the ground truth, whether or not it has saxophone. And then that samples ID. OK, now. Now onto the actual design of the neural net. And this is also a class that you are going to custom write that inherits from the provided parent class. Uh, this is where you define the architecture and your activation functions and such. And also you define the feed forward process. So we start with a few different import imports. The torch.nn, this is the, uh, this is, this is the, this is where all of the uh, layer objects and such live. Uh, nn.functional is all of your activation functions, softmax, all that fun stuff. Uh, we then create the class uh, inheriting from the module base class. And we'll have to define two, two methods here, init again, and then forward. Init is where the architecture uh, will live, and then forward is where the feed forward happens. So to start the init, uh, we're just passing it a couple different parameters. RS here is just for a random seed so that we can actually try to replicate the same process a few times. Uh, normal, if it's set to true, uh, will initialize the weight based on a normal distribution instead of a uniform distribution. Uh, this, is, this is something that I had to bang my head up against uh, for a while to figure out, and we'll get to why in a little bit. <laughs> and then, of course, we just run super to run the initialization unit method of the parent class. Next, you have uh, your first convolutional and max pooling pair. Uh, the convolutional layer follows the, the uh, convention of in channels, out channels, uh, one side of your current, uh, of your kernel. If you only give it an integer, it assumes that that's going to be a square. And then your stride. And with your max pooling, first number specifies the kernel, uh, the kernel dimensions, and second, your stride. The next pair follows the same convention. And then the uh, fully connected layers, you're just specifying input channels and output channels. Now these dimensions there are set up for my spectrogram dimensions that I ended up using, which are 128 by 108. If you wanted to customize, you, you would have to customize all of these different numbers to, um, to fit whatever you're feeding it. And, it's a little bit of a, a process. I ended up writing a function that would help me determine this. Um, but you got to get it right, otherwise it breaks. So moving on here, this is where uh, we apply the, the uh, real reinitialization of the weights on a normal distribution, if that's true. Uh, it does automatically initialize the weights as soon as you uh, instantiate the class. So this is just to do it the way we want it to be done. Next to the uh, forward method, uh, this will take a 4D tensor as its input. Now this is just, this is a batch of data, so this is a stack of 3D tensors here. And first we pass it to the first convolutional layer, then our activation function is ReLU, then to the first max pooling layer, and again for the second batch. Here we have to reshape our outputs for the fully connected layer, because we need to take all of the uh, all of the tensors for one spectrogram and then turn them into a single dimension column vector. Next, first fully connected layer, 
with Ray Lewis deactivation function and again. Here we apply softmax to turn the outputs into probabilities. This constrains them so that they both sum to one. And then return the probabilities for each of the two categories for each of the samples in the batch. So now we can move on to the fit function. Uh, this is what this is where you define uh, this is where feed forward and back propagation happen to train the model. Uh, you provide your optimizer here. So are we going to use stochastic gradient descent, RMS crop, atom, etc. Uh, PyTorch has a bunch for you to choose from. If what you, if what you want isn't there, which is unlikely, you of course have the opportunity to knock yourself out and make your own. Uh, this is also where you provide your loss criterion, which in the case of this binary classifier, I'm going with cross-entropy loss. Uh, now you've also set the number of training epochs here for whatever other stop criterion you might have. So to set it up, first we have to import the variable object. And this is just a wrapper around any torch tensor that kind of keeps a record of any operations you might apply to it. Uh, for instance, this is essential for backpropagation, so it records gradients and such. Next, we pass it a bunch of different objects. We pass it the model object itself, the data set object that we've created, our optimizer of choice, our loss criterion, the number of epics we wanted to run, and then the batch size. Uh, I haven't played around yet with other stopping criterion here, criterion here, but this is of course, where you could have been. So we're going to instantiate a train loader here, uh, passing it the data set class, uh, setting the batch size. We want to set shuffle to true because we want it to be shuffled every time, or every epic we want to reshuffle. Number of workers, two, to take advantage of all the blazing fast power that my MacBook Air has to offer. And then drop last, we set to true. Now this will discard the remaining batch at the end if the number of records there is smaller than our batch size, which is important if you have a batch size of eight, say, and you have a 65 sample or a record set. Our last round would have one sample in it, and we don't necessarily want this one sample to get an equal vote to all these other batches of eight. So next, I just create a loss by epic uh, FDE list. We're going to just, this is just to keep track of the loss so we have something to analyze and graph and do an on about later. So then we start cycling through all our epics. And there's a bit of verbosity just so that we know where we are and we can see the progress as it's happening. Uh, set the running loss for that epic to zero. Create an empty numpy array for loss per batch and then a timestamp so we can time things. Now we are going to loop through the, uh, we're going to iterate through the training loader object that we created up above. Um, again, another timestamp. Here is where we unpack the, the, uh, the batch from the training loader. Remember, this is a stack of the tuples that we're returning with the get item method that we defined a few slides ago. So first we get the spectrograms, then we get the labels, and then we get the IDs, but we don't need those here, so we're just going to dump them for now. Next, we wrap each one of these in a variable, um, and then zero out the greater gradients with our optimizer. And if you don't do this each time around, it's going to accumulate from the previous round. Here's feed forward. We pass the spectrograms to our, uh, to our model object and collect the outputs. Pass the outputs and the labels, so the predicting, predicted values and the actual values to our loss criterion, to cross entropy loss here, which gives us a loss object. We run the backward method on the, log, on the loss object, which performs backdrop over the entire graph and uh, computes the gradients. And then we update the weights on the optimizer. So here you have it. This is feed forward and backprop in eight lines of code. Uh, then we finish it out just with some more verbosity and record keeping and timing, just so we have a little bit of an idea of what's going on, how it's performing. And then close out the epic loop 
by recording the rest of the loss values into the list that we created at the beginning. Finally, print training is complete and return a NumPy array of all the loss values. So here we can see it in action. You've uh, survived a whole lot of code on the screen, so let's watch a movie. Uh, we're passing it our model object here, and then the data set object, then our optimizer, which in this case would be stochastic gradient descent. Now this, you need to pass it, um, what ends up being a generator object of all the different learnable parameters in the model. So CNNTest.parameters will generate that generator object. You pass it to uh, gradient descent. You, know, you can also set the learning rate. Uh, each one of the optimizers has a bunch of different parameters that you can play with, such as L2, uh, epsilon per atom, et cetera. Next, we feed it cross entropy loss, and then we set the number of training epics. And as it runs, you can see that the average loss per epic starts to decrease every, every day, with, 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 with every next epic. Now, this is blazing fast, but keep in mind that this is just, this is my proof of concept data set, which is 80 different spectrograms on one eighth scale. They're tiny. So we're, we're using, for, for the final model, I was using about 800. 900, I think, and those were on one quarter scale. So it took a little longer than that. Finally, we look at the predict function. <clears throat> now this is, this carries out feed forward for the training and test data. It outputs the probabilities for each category, and then we translate those outputs into predictions. Uh, so again, we're going to feed it a few different objects, our model object, our data set object, and then we'll set our batch size, and what format we want the results in, uh, either a pandas data frame or a dictionary. So here I set it up as a default to a pandas data frame. And again, like before, in the fit function, we, uh, we create an instance of our data loader object. Uh, everything is pretty similar here, but we are going to set shuffle to false because we're only going to go through it once anyways. Uh, we do want to maintain the order, the order. Uh, and then we don't need, we don't want to drop the last ones because we want to predict on them all. Create an empty results dictionary and then start iterating through the loader object again. Uh, we unpack the object, the batch object as before, but this time we keep our IDs because we do need to match them up later on so we know which sample we're talking about. Next, feed forward, feed forward the spectrograms. Uh, and then this, this, compute, this, this looks at, this computes the maximum probability for each, um, for each record. And it will out output that maximum value, which we don't need, and also the index value of the maximum, which ends up being our zero or our one. Uh, so this is what we save as our prediction. Now each one of these in the inside the zip function will be a column vector that is as long as our batch size. So we want to iterate through all of them, and then for each one, for each value, we, we store the actual value, the predicted value, and the output probabilities in a dictionary with the sample ID as the key. And then if we want to add a pandas data frame, data frame, convert that to a data frame, and then return the results. All right, now we can move on to the model design and training. Now, earlier I showed a video of that fit function, and you could see that the cross entropy loss was declining each, each epic as it should. Now, it wasn't always like that. <coughs> You can see here that it just got stuck. And this is how it was for a whole lot of time. This was my nut to crack. After doing, after creating a data set, <laughs> after figuring out how to use PyTorch, after creating all these classes and functions, I got it to work and it wasn't learning. So in order to figure out how this, how to crack this, we had to consider 
loss functions and shapes and such. So our ideal loss function is going to be convex, and there's going to be one minimum. Now, this is the case with, say, uh, mean square error, as it would be for linear regression, or log loss or hinge loss with classifiers. You perform gradient descent, and you stop when you find the bottom. Now, there's no way to really know what the loss function of a multi-dimensional neural net looks like, but mine probably looks something like this. Now, you start on one side of the ridge, and you'll fall into a large local minimum, which I started to label Death Valley. Uh, your model just learns nothing, and you're stuck. Then the danger with the other side is that you might fall into the abyss of overfitting where your model has just memorized your training set and it's useless for generalizing on anything else. Now there's a few different things that you can do to address your issues. First, you can adjust your initialization settings so that you fall on the right side of the ridge. Second, you can adjust your step size at the beginning and take smaller, more careful steps so you don't fall into that desert. And then you can increase your batch size so that any steps are slightly smaller and a little safer. And then finally, you can optimize your number of training epics so you end up in perfect paradise. So through cross-validation, I did manage to escape Death Valley and avoid, avoid the abyss. Now, this is not SKLearn. There is no cross-validation utility. There is no train test split definitely not a random search or a grid search. So if you want to use these things, you have to build your own. Um, I put together the most basic of cross-validation functions, which just randomly assign samples to a, uh, to, to a fold based on however many folds there are. Um, I didn't add in a stratify option yet, but this is one of the reasons that I picked my data set to be as perfectly balanced as I could. Uh, incidentally, I just found out about something called Scorch, which apparently wraps uh, PyTorch in a format that you can then interface with SKLearn. Would have been really cool to have found out about this about a month and a half ago. I haven't yet gotten a chance to play with it, so I can't report on that. But if you are going to play around with PyTorch and you know SKLearn and you want to use some of those utilities, definitely check that out because you can probably save yourself a lot of time. <laughs> so moving on to the parameters, there are a few things that I did manage to do so that uh, I can get out of that desert. First, this is where I decided to initialize the weights from a normal distribution instead of uniform, which kept them all grouped closer to zero and uh, you know, there weren't as many outlying values that could really drive this crazy first step that would send you into 0.693 irrecoverable doom. Next, I, I upped the mini-batch size to 16, which served to constrain the steps a little more. You know, smaller steps, safer, maybe not going to converge as fast, but the steps aren't going to be quite as wild either. And finally, I settled on the atom optimization method uh, its dynamic learning rate and momentum allow me to take very small steps at the beginning, but then as soon as it figures out that it's on the right track, it accelerates drastically. So once we uh, were able to tune into some parameters that work, I could start looking at how it's performing over time. And here you can see, with every epic, the cross-entropy loss for that epic is decreasing, and it's starting to level out around 10 to 12 epics. If you look at the loss per mini-batch, it follows that same trend as the average, but there's a lot of variation from batch to batch, to be expected. Now, this plot illustrates how your training epics can greatly influence uh, the performance of your model. We're looking at a plot of in and out of sample accuracy per training epic. Uh, in sample would be your training data, this is, it's seen it before, this is your red. Out of sample is the wild data that the model hasn't seen before, that's the blue. So too few epics in your model really hasn't learned anything. Uh, you can see it's predicting about the same accuracy on the training test set. 
And actually, if I look at the predictions for one or two ethics, it's, it's just predicting all one or all the other. It's it, everything's saxophone or everything's no saxophone. And it starts to catch on that it might need to actually make a choice about you know, three or four ethics. So to many, and here we are in that territory where your model has just memorized your training set, and it can't really generalize so well to any new data. And in playing around with this, I could very easily get it to the point where it memorizes the training set and gets 100% accuracy there. But it's useless when you get 60% on your training set. So. What we want is right here in the middle where your model hasn't memorized that training set uh, and it can still generalize to new data that it finds. So now let's look at how well it did in the end. Uh, now accuracy was my main goal here. How many of everything did it get right? And I could afford to chase this because I did have this balanced data set again. Uh, but to get a better picture of how the model was performing, I also looked at recalls. So how many of the saxophone samples did it get right? And how many and specificity, how many without saxophone did it get right? All in all, for a proof of concept model, it did pretty well with you know 84% accuracy on the train and 77% on the test. Its strengths were in saxophone detection, as we can see, with about a 3% gap between the two recall scores, but it wasn't doing so well on specificity, as we can see there with a 10% gap. So let's check out something that the model got right. So this is a Johnny Griffin tenor sax solo appropriately from a song called Chicago Calling. This was a random choice. Uh, and you can see that there are these uh, characteristic striations like we saw in the previous sample that I used as the intro. And you can also see some diagonal lines where the pitch is bending and scooping into other pitches and such. Uh, interesting to note that up at the top, where the frequencies are highest, there's not a whole lot of activity. So everything above prediction is, is, is much more muted than anything below it, until you get to some of the higher notes at the end. But where did it miss? <laughs> All you Van Halen fans out there will recognize this as the opening solo to Mean Streets, which everyone knows that there's not a saxophone on any of the Van Halen albums. <laughs> Although there is a clarinet on Better Down, interestingly enough, and that's Eddie Van Halen's dad. Fun fact for the night. Anyways, why did it get confused? Um, it's a very harmonically dense instrument here. It's also a solo instrument, so you don't get any cues from percussion. Uh, we don't necessarily want that to be a factor in saxophone detection, but I can't guarantee that it's not in this model. Uh, and also we see that in the top frequencies, which would roughly be about 10,000 hertz and up, there's very little activity, just like the previous sample. So any of these could have caused confusion. Mm -hmm. Now, I was, I was pretty pleased with the scores that I got as a proof of concept uh, model, but obviously this is not the 95% plus accuracy that we've come to know and love from neural network models. Um, and there's only so much that I could do in a four week project, so of course I have a massive wish list for next phases. Here's some highlights. First, I'd love to spend a lot more time tuning the CNN architecture so I can increase the accuracy and address overfitting. I had very little time to do this, uh, I would love to play around with adding layers, subtracting layers, how many filters do I have per layer, what's my kernel size, um, what are the counts on my fully connected layers. I'd also really like to play around with different activation functions. I use ReLU throughout um, just for kicks. I'd love to throw Tench and, and Sigmoid in there. And I also was reading that the uh, exponential linear unit or ALU function is really good for, binary, for, for classifiers. So big wish list. And obviously, any one of these parameters that you change could, could influence all of the other ones. And if we're trying to do a grid search on all the possible <laughs> parameters here, you're going to be waiting a very, very, very long time. 
And this is actually one of the most interesting things to me about neural nets is that there's, there's so much that you can't really nail down that it gets to be an art. And I guess that makes me feel a little more at home coming from music. So this will be, a, it'll be many, many hours of playing around with uh, the, the architecture and whatnot. Next, PyTorch does offer a transfer learning option. And with the limited data set that I currently have, uh, it would be great to use a pre-trained convolutional set and then see what I can do with that. Um, and of course, as everyone will say after every single project that they do, I would love to do it with more data. Um, I do have about 20,000 more samples to get labeled. So if I can somehow figure out how to make my site go viral on Reddit, I will have that set. Not yet. And of course, given more data, I would very much like to move to GPUs on AWS. PyTorch makes it incredibly easy to use GPUs. It's really just two lines of code in your model object and you're up and running. So as with any project, this one is far from done. And it may never be, but I'm definitely looking forward to seeing where I can take it. And it will be my pet project for a long, long time here forward. And with that, thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate you coming out on a night where it's very nasty out, so I appreciate it. Thank you. Justin? I was wondering if you've looked at uh, if certain frequencies were more informative than others. I haven't managed to figure out how that is yet, but that is something I thought about, like using a filter. Um, yeah, or the cropping spectrum. So. Higher resolution and certain frequencies and yeah. others. Definitely. And that's using a, a different resolution on the spectrogram would be something that I'd like to do too. You know, this as I said, those were quarter scale. Um, so yeah, obviously a, a full scale spectrogram would be and that's that's completely arbitrary. Full scale is just determined by how I set those parameters. Um, but that would be 16 times larger than the ones I've been using, and that would take a lot longer. So maybe that's my excuse to move to GPUs. But yeah, that would be really interesting to zoom in on different different ranges and see how that worked. Yes. So you mentioned that there's a slew of pre-processing algorithms that you can apply to visual uh, data. Did you apply any of those in this case? And also. Are there a different set of uh, pre-processing algorithms that you might do specifically for spectrograms to capture their inherent architecture? So, yeah. The first part of the question was... Uh, did you apply any of the visual right. pre-processing right. transformation? And no, I did not because, because I was setting the parameters for the, uh, for the spectrograms myself. That would scale them. Um, that, or that kept them all on the same scale. I didn't really see any use to zooming in on different parts of the spectrogram, um, so like using a crop or something like that, because you really want that full spectral, um, or I, I figured at least that it was my logic that you'd want all of the uh, frequency information per, 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 uh, per sample. Uh, I didn't use any of the Python built-ins for audio, but on the back end or on the on the uh, the Rosa end where I was making the spectrogram, I did choose to normalize everything. So just you know bump the uh, most powerful all the way up to one, and then I chose to use a decimal scale as opposed to just straight power. So um, that's <laughs> other other parameters that you can play with, but. Why did you choose CNN as an architecture for this one? Why did you choose CNN for this one? Well, I know that there are other ways to get the information out of audio and try to analyze it with neural nets. Um, a lot of this was just because I wanted the experience with uh, <laughs> CNN. And I knew that you know, when you're dealing with two-dimensional data, um, which is essentially an image that CNNs are the way to go with that. Um, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't necessarily be as easy to do that with random forest or something like that as well. 
And what about uh, choosing PyTorch? Could you have chosen like something else? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I was just curious. Okay. Uh, like, and that, that's another disclaimer. This is my first neural net project, and I have not used Keras. Um, you know, it, it's part of the DIY uh, allure when someone says, "Oh, this is challenging and it's new, and there's not much documentation. See if you can figure this out." Okay, I'll do that. Yeah, I need to build it, all this stuff by, myself. You know, so. So there is a project actually with PyTorch. They're trying to generate more music. So can okay, you yeah. like with a GAN uh, yeah. generate a addressable net network? So I think it could be another thing you can try from a uh, fake example. Yeah, that's well, and that's I think uh, I've only looked into Magento a little bit, but I believe that has that's mostly a generative yeah. experiment, right? So right. and yeah, PyTorch has all the LSTM layers and such that you need to try to do something like that. So that's definitely a wish list. I know very little about that though, how to go about it. Did your project, how long was your full run taking? Was it a matter of minutes or hours or days? Actually, only minutes. And I think this is part of the strength of PyTorch as well. Um, I was looking at about 10 seconds per epic uh, for the final training run. Now, that, that cross validation took a little bit longer when you're trying to go through all that, you know, five folds and whatnot, but uh, pretty, pretty fast. Do you know how many weights your neural net had in total? Oh shoot! I looked it up. I don't really. I, I can't. I don't know right off the top of my head. Uh, so I don't know a lot about audio processing. Mm -hmm. but do you think there'd be any benefit in capturing base information in a certain channel? Based on what I know, um, I think that would be more. What's, what's the process called? There's, there's one, I'm, I'm blanking on, on what it is, but there's one where you, as long as each audio source has, an in, or as long as each audio component has its own source, you can then kind of rotate it and pull out different components. Um, I'm not sure that phase, if, if you're just looking at frequency information versus time, um, and a spectrogram, I'm not sure that that would make a difference. Okay. I don't know for sure. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Just with the musician's background, is there yeah. information that's, that's preserved in phase that wouldn't really show up in, in the magnetic? Well, that's, huh. I mean, that's giving you an idea of where things would be located in space. So, you know, if you had two different channels, um, when you hear the phase shifting, that can tell you that something's moving. Um, so if it's static, probably not a whole lot. Um, well, again, I'm kind of shooting from the hip here. Uh, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm asking because I'm considering a very similar project. Oh, OK. Oh. Throw some ideas around that. Did you try the piano or vocal since you were getting that data too? No, uh, yeah, I kind of skimmed over those. Those were, uh, I was collecting those just so that if I wanted to try it on other things, I would have the information and I wouldn't have to go back and label again. Um, and it turned out I was very much occupied enough with chasing the saxophone, but they're all there and it would be pretty easy to pull another data set and, and try it. So probably one of the easiest things to chase at this point. <laughs> yeah, like to that point, it'd be kind of an interesting extension to do like a multi-label mm -hmm. classification, mm -hmm. kind of picking out all the instruments with any given sample. You, you to totally could, yeah, just give it, you know, as many outputs as there were instruments, yeah. um, which yeah. next phase is the, uh, the Irma's data set there, it has to have 10 different labels. 10 different labels. Um, one of the reasons I didn't use it uh, was that they only labeled the primary instrument in each sample, and then I think like 
on some of the samples, they labeled whether or not it contained drum sets and what style it was, but that wasn't even consistent. So, you know, you didn't have any information besides like, this has saxophone in the foreground. You didn't, you didn't have like, it has some piano, but it's in the background, or it doesn't have vocals or anything. Uh, but that does have 10 different instruments labeled. So, you know, that's probably one I would jump to if I wanted to try this on multi -class. Did you uh, look at all at extracting the activations from the fully connected layers? Is that something that's easy to do in PyTorch? Um, yeah, there's a, I think, oh, I never had it up here, but there's a, per no, it was. Uh, when, I, when I mentioned that you have to pass the generator object to the, um, to the optimizer, uh, that you just run the parameters off method on the model object, and that returns all the ways and learnable parameters for each, each of these layers. So I think you can find it there. So one interesting thing might be to take your classifier and take all of your data mm -hmm. and extract the vector from that second mm -hmm. last layer, yeah. and then organize them. And maybe they yeah. group into groups, and you can quickly label a bunch of stuff. Yes. That would be really cool, yeah. And it's, yeah, it's pretty, I was playing with looking at weights and such earlier today. It's, it's pretty easy to pull out, so, cool. yeah. I was just going to ask, how long did you actually train it for? I don't know if someone over there asked, I'm like, what happened up? Oh, yeah, uh, so I used, I think it was about 900 some samples to train it in the end. and. With 12 epics, it was only about 10 seconds per epic. So the model is trained in a minute and a half. So you got that accuracy with a minute and a half of training? Mm -hmm. That's pretty good. I mean, of course, all the cross metal and whatnot to figure out. If you increased the epics by launch, wouldn't that be essentially mimic more data? Um, Without have you having a hand label a lot more? That would be. I might. I mean, if, 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 without doing some sort of transform on the input spectrograms, it would just learn those really, really well. And I did that just for fun. I cranked it all the way up to 50 epics and, you know, yeah. took a coffee break and came back. And, you know, it, it learned that training set. It was 100% accurate, but uh, the accuracy on the test set would fall off to about 65. Um, so I think you could do something. Huh. You, you could possibly write your own transform where you take like a one second slice of each five second sample and just randomly each time, and th that might be a way to kind of bootstrap your way up. Is there no way to amend the original data set by, because the labels would say the same, but uh -huh. you can change the data set by changing the frequency or the pitch or oh. creating that kind of diversity? Hmm. Possible. I mean, it, the pitch shift is getting a lot better these days. Uh, like 10 years ago, I would, I would have said it just leaves too many artifacts. Um, but yeah, you, you, you might be able to. <laughs> I mean, if the hand labeling is the your future, your blocker, then. Yeah. yeah. You can also add noise, like random background noise to oh. clips. Yeah, yeah. Did you get data on multiple human assessments of hard to categorize uh, data or spectrograms or sounds actually? And I'm, I'm asking because I'm wondering if the errors that it was making actually correlates with human error or human skipping. Like, if right. you took all the ones that they skipped and said, "How do you classify that?" Do you find that it's more like in the 50-50? So, okay, the, the skip samples are when 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 you hit skip, it just labels that in Mongo as skip. So it, it, it basically trashes them until someone can come back and, and review. Um, and I haven't used it on any of the intermediate ones. Um, having multiple people verify each sample is also something that I'd love to do on any, uh, but well, what, one of the one of the things I wanted to do, uh, I was trying to do was to get my 
alma mater on board, which is University of Michigan. And I know that they have hundreds of music undergrads that could each do 50 of these for their musicology class or their music tech class. And then all of a sudden, I would have 5,000, 10,000 more samples. And it would, yeah, it would be great to have some sort of a validation in there where a sample needs to be labeled twice at, with the right, you know, twice with the same label. Otherwise, it's flagged, same as skip. But you know, this, I made some, I made some errors. It, you know, in my sprints of like sitting there at you know midnight and labeling 50 of them. So I'm sure other people made errors. I, I would say. I would hope that the data set is somewhere between 95 and 99 percent accurate, but uh, you know, there's, there's no way to really decide that until I go back and listen to every single sample. Sample. Good winter project. So. I, I guess I mean that the errors could actually be advantageous mm. to you because you could be assessing if the errors that your algorithm makes mimics human oh, error oh, or create, basically oh, captures right. the uncertainty in, in the classification itself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right. I had a similar question. I mean, if you think about you know, humans making errors as a result of, I think, variables, right? So you have lots of noise in the sample that was a mistake. Mm -hmm. Humans make those mistakes, and it could just be, I'm thinking, if you were to slice your data, if you could slice your data such that the uh, number of frequencies involved is a variable, uh, attenuation on each frequency is a variable. And the more of all those that you have, the less accurate your model becomes. So, as you were explaining at the very beginning, you got your Google Notes, you would grab yeah. it one instantly, it knows what it is. Yeah. Then you have all these sounds, all these frequencies, all shifting simultaneously, yeah. and suddenly your model starts getting worse and worse and worse. Yeah. And that happens to humans too. I mean, sure. You can only hold a couple, you know, one or two conversations, then yeah. five people talking, you don't understand anything. 